Section 27 of The Colonel's Dream. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Colonel's Dream by Charles Chestnut. Section 27, Chapter 27. His first step was to have Caxton look up and abstract for him the criminal laws of the state. They were bad enough in all conscience. Men could be tried without jury and condemned to infamous punishments involving stripes and chains for misdemeanors which in more enlightened states were punished with a small fine or brief detention. There were, for instance, no degrees of larceny, and the heaviest punishment might be inflicted, at the discretion of the judge, for the least offense. The vagrancy law, of which the colonel had had some experience, was an open bid for injustice and graft, and clearly designed to profit the strong at the expense of the weak. The crop lien laws were little more than the instruments of organized robbery. To these laws the colonel called the attention of some of his neighbors, with whom he was on terms of intimacy. The enlightened few had scarcely known of their existence, and quite agreed that the laws were harsh and ought to be changed. But when the colonel, pursuing his inquiry, undertook to investigate the operation of these laws, he found an appalling condition. The statutes were mild and beneficent compared with the results obtained under cover of them. Caxton spent several weeks about the state looking up the criminal records and following up the sentences inflicted, working not merely for his fee but sharing the colonel's indignation at the state of things unearthed. Convict labor was contracted out to private parties, with little or no effective state supervision, on terms which, though exceedingly profitable to the state, were disastrous to free competitive labor. More than one lawmaker besides Fetters was numbered among these contractors. Leaving the realm of crime, they found that on hundreds of farms, ignorant Negroes and sometimes poor whites were held in bondage under claims of debt or under contracts of exclusive employment for long terms of years, contracts extorted from ignorance by craft, aided by the state laws which made it a misdemeanor to employ such persons elsewhere. Freemen were worked side by side with convicts from the penitentiary, and women and children herded with the most depraved criminals, thus breeding a criminal class to prey upon the state. In the case of Fetters alone, the colonel found a dozen instances where the law, bad as it was, had not been sufficient for Fetters' purpose, but had been plainly violated. Caxton discovered a discharged guard of Fetters, who told him of many things that had taken place at Sycamore, and brought another guard one evening, at that time employed there, who told him, among other things, that Bud Johnson's life, owing to his surliness and rebellious conduct, and some spite which Haynes seemed to bear against him, was simply a hell on earth, that even a strong negro could not stand it indefinitely. A case was made up and submitted to the grand jury. Witnesses were summoned at the colonel's instance. At the last moment they all weakened, even the discharged guard, and their testimony was not sufficient to justify an indictment. The colonel then sued out a writ of habeas corpus for the body of Bud Johnson, and it was heard before the Common Pleas Court at Clarendon, with public opinion divided between the colonel and Fetters. The court held that under his contract, for which he had paid the consideration, Fetters was entitled to Johnson's services. The colonel, defeated but still undismayed, ordered Caxton to prepare a memorial for presentation to the federal authorities, calling their attention to the fact that peonage, a crime under the federal statutes, was being flagrantly practiced in the state. This allegation was supported by a voluminous brief, giving names and dates and particular instances of barbarity. The colonel was not without some quiet support in this movement. There were several public-spirited men in the county, including his able Lieutenant Caxton, Dr. Price, and old General Thornton, none of whom were under any obligation to fetters and who all acknowledged that something ought to be done to purge the state of a great disgrace. There was another party, of course, which deprecated any scandal which would involve the good name of the state or reflect upon the South, and who insisted that in time these things would pass away, and there would be no trace of them in future generations. 
but the colonel insisted that so also would the victims of the system pass away, who, being already in existence, were certainly entitled to as much consideration as generations yet unborn. It was hardly fair to sacrifice them to a mere punctilio. The colonel had reached the conviction that the regenerative forces of education and enlightenment, in order to have any effect in his generation, must be reinforced by some positive legislative or executive action, or else the untrammeled forces of graft and greed would override them, and he was human enough at this stage of his career to wish to see the result of his labors, or at least a promise of result. The colonel's papers were forwarded to the proper place whence they were referred from official to official, and from department to department. That it might take some time to set in motion the machinery necessary to reach the evil, the colonel knew very well, and hence was not impatient at any reasonable delay. Had he known that his presentation had created a sensation in the highest quarter, but that owing to the exigencies of national politics it was not deemed wise at that time, to do anything which seemed like an invasion of state rights or savored of sectionalism, he might not have been so serenely confident of the outcome. Nor had Fetters known as much would he have done one thing which encouraged the colonel more than anything else. Caxton received a message one day from Judge Bullard representing Fetters, in which Fetters made the offer that if Colonel French would stop his agitation on the labor laws and withdraw any papers he had filed, and promised to drop the whole matter, he would release Bud Johnson. The colonel did not hesitate a moment. He had gone into this fight for Johnson, or rather to please Miss Laura. He had risen now to higher game. Nothing less than the system would satisfy him. But colonel, said Caxton, it's pretty hard on the nigger. They'll kill him before his time's up. If you'll give me a free hand, I'll get him anyway. How? Perhaps it's just as well you shouldn't know. But I have friends at Sycamore. You wouldn't break the law, asked the colonel. Fetters is breaking the law, replied Caxton. He's holding Johnson for debt. And whether that is lawful or not, he certainly has no right to kill him. You're right, replied the colonel. Get Johnson away. I don't care how. The end justifies the means. That's an argument that goes down here. Get him away, and send him a long way off, and he can write for his wife to join him. His escape need not interfere with our other plans. We have plenty of other cases against Fetters. Within a week, Johnson, with the connivance of a bribed guard, a poor white man from Clarendon, had escaped from Fetters and seemingly vanished from Beaver County. Fetters' lieutenants were active in their search for him, but sought in vain. End of section 27, recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 28 of The Colonel's Dream. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White The Colonel's Dream by Charles Chestnut Section 28, Chapter 28 Ben Dudley awoke the morning after the assembly ball with a violent headache and a sense of extreme depression, which was not relieved by the sight of his reflection in the looking-glass of the bureau in the hotel bedroom where he found himself. One of his eyes was bloodshot and surrounded by a wide area of discoloration and he was conscious of several painful contusions on other portions of his body. His clothing was badly disordered and stained with blood, and all in all he was scarcely in a condition to appear in public. He made such a toilet as he could, and, anxious to avoid observation, had his horse brought from the livery around to the rear door of the hotel, and left for Mink Run by the back streets. He did not return to town for a week, and when he made his next appearance there, upon strictly a business visit, did not go near the Treadwells, and wore such a repellent look that no one ventured to speak to him about his encounter with Fetters and McCrae. He was humiliated and ashamed and angry with himself and all the world. He had lost Graciela already. 
any possibility that might have remained of regaining her affection was destroyed by his having made her name the excuse for a barroom broil his uncle was not well and with the decline of his health his monomania grew more acute and more absorbing and he spent most of his time in the search for the treasure and in expostulations with viney to reveal its whereabouts the supervision of the plantation work occupied ben most of the time and during his intervals of leisure he sought to escape unpleasant thoughts by busying himself with the model of his cotton gin his life had run along in this way for about two weeks after the ball when one night barclay fetters while coming to town from his father's plantation at sycamore in company with turner his father's foreman was fired upon from ambush in the neighborhood of mink run and seriously wounded groaning heavily and in a state of semi-unconsciousness he was driven by turner in the same buggy in which he had been shot to dr price's house which lay between mink run and the town the doctor examined the wound which was serious a charge of buckshot had been fired at close range from a clump of bushes by the wayside and the charge had taken effect in the side of the face the sight of one eye was destroyed beyond a peradventure and that of the other endangered by a possible injury to the optic nerve a sedative was administered as many as possible of the shot extracted and the wounds dressed meantime a messenger was dispatched to sycamore for fetters senior who came before morning post haste to his anxious inquiries the doctor could give no very hopeful answer he's not out of danger said dr price and won't be for several days i haven't found several of those shot and until they're located i can't tell what will happen your son has a good constitution but it has been abused somewhat and is not in the best condition to throw off an injury do the best you can for him doc said fetters and i'll make it worth your while and as for the double damned scoundrel that shot him in the dark i'll rake this country with a fine-tooth comb till he's found if bark dies the murderer shall hang as high as Haman, if it cost me a million dollars. Or, if Bark gets well, he shall have the limit of the law. No man in this state shall injure me or mine and go unpunished. The next day, Ben Dudley was arrested at Mink Run, on a warrant sworn out by Fetters, Sr., charging Dudley with attempted murder. The accused was brought to Clarendon and lodged in Beaver County Jail. Ben sent for Caxton, from whom he learned that his offense was not subject to bail until it became certain that Barclay Fetters would recover. For in the event of his death, the charge would be murder. In case of recovery, the offense would be merely attempted murder, or shooting with intent to kill, for which bail was allowable. Meantime, he would have to remain in jail. In a day or two, young Fetters was pronounced out of danger, so far as his life was concerned, and Colonel French, through Caxton, offered to sign Ben's bail bond. To Caxton's surprise, Dudley refused to accept bail at the colonel's hands. "'I don't want any favors from Colonel French,' he said decidedly. "'I prefer to stay in jail rather than to be released on his bond.' So he remained in jail. Graciela was not much surprised at Ben's refusal to accept bail. She had reasoned out, with a fine instinct, the train of emotions which had brought her lover to grief, and her own share in stirring them up. She could not believe that Ben was capable of shooting a man from ambush. But even if he had, it would have been for love of her, and if he had not, she had nevertheless been the moving cause of the disaster. She would not willingly have done young Mr. Fetters an injury. He had favored her by his attentions, and if all stories were true, he had behaved better than Ben in the difficulty between them, and had suffered more. But she loved Ben as she grew to realize more and more. She wanted to go and see Ben in jail, but her aunt did not think it proper. Appearances were all against Ben, and he had not purged himself by any explanation. So Graciela sat down and wrote him a long letter. She knew very well that the one thing that would do him most good would be the announcement of her Aunt Laura's engagement to Colonel French. There was no way to bring this about, except by first securing her aunt's permission. This would make necessary a frank confession, to which, after an effort, she nerved herself. Aunt Laura, she said at a moment when they were alone together, 
I know why Ben will not accept bail from Colonel French, and why he will not tell his side of the quarrel between himself and Mr. Fetters. He was foolish enough to imagine that Colonel French was coming to the house to see me, and that I preferred the Colonel to him. And, Aunt Laura, I have a confession to make. I have done something for which I want to beg your pardon. I listened that night, and overheard the Colonel ask you to be his wife. Please, dear Aunt Laura, forgive me, and let me write and tell Ben. Just Ben, in confidence. No one else need know it. Miss Laura was shocked and pained and frankly said so, but could not refuse the permission, on condition that Ben should be pledged to keep her secret, which, for reasons of her own, she was not yet ready to make public. She, too, was fond of Ben, and hoped that he might clear himself of the accusation. So Graciela wrote the letter. She was no more frank in it, however, on one point, than she had been with her aunt, for she carefully avoided saying that she had taken Colonel French's attention seriously or built any hopes upon them, but chided Ben for putting such a construction upon her innocent actions, and informed him, as proof of his folly, and in the strictest confidence that Colonel French was engaged to her Aunt Laura. She expressed her sorrow for his predicament, her profound belief in his innocence, and her unhesitating conviction that he would be acquitted of the pending charge. To this she expected by way of answer a long letter of apology, explanation, and protestations of undying love. She received instead a brief note containing a cold acknowledgment of her letter, thanking her for her interest in his welfare and assuring her that he would respect Miss Laura's confidence. There was no note of love or reproachfulness, mere cold courtesy. Graciela was cut to the quick, so much so that she did not even notice Ben's mistakes in spelling. It would have been better had he overwhelmed her with reproaches. It would have shown at least that he still loved her. She cried bitterly, and lay awake very late that night, wondering what else she could do for Ben that a self-respecting young lady might. For the first time she was more concerned about Ben than herself. If by marrying him immediately she could have saved him from danger and disgrace, she would have done so without one selfish thought unless it were selfish to save one whom she loved. The preliminary hearing in the case of the State v. Benjamin Dudley was held as soon as Dr. Price pronounced Barclay Fetters out of danger. The proceedings took place before Squire Reddick, the same justice from whom the colonel had bought Peter's services, and from whom he had vainly sought to secure Bud Johnson's release. In spite of Dudley's curt refusal of his assistance, the colonel, to whom Miss Laura had conveyed a hint of the young man's frame of mind, had instructed Caxton to spare no trouble or expense in the prisoner's interest. There was little doubt, considering Fetter's influence and vindictiveness, that Dudley would be remanded, though the evidence against him was purely circumstantial. But it was important that the evidence should be carefully scrutinized and every legal safeguard put to use. The case looked bad for the prisoner. Barclay Fetters was not present, nor did the prosecution need him. His testimony could only have been cumulative. Turner described the circumstances of the shooting from the trees by the roadside near Mink Run, and the driving of the wounded man to Dr. Price's. Dr. Price swore to the nature of the wound, its present and probable consequences, which involved the loss of one eye and perhaps the other, and produced the shot he had extracted. McRae testified that he and Barclay Fetters had gone down between dances from the opera ball to the hotel bar to get a glass of seltzer. They had no sooner entered the bar than the prisoner, who had evidently been drinking heavily and showed all the signs of intoxication, had picked a quarrel with them and assaulted Mr. Fetters. Fetters, with the aid of the witness, had defended himself. In the course of the altercation, the prisoner had used violent and profane language threatening, among other things, to kill Fetters. All this testimony was objected to, but was admitted as tending to show a motive for the crime. This closed the state's case. Caxton held a hurried consultation with his client. Should they put in any evidence which would be merely to show their hand, since the prisoner would, in any event, undoubtedly be bound over? Ben was unable to deny what had taken place at the hotel for he had no distinct recollection of it, merely a blurred impression, 
like the memory of a bad dream. He could not swear that he had not threatened Fetters. The state's witnesses had refrained from mentioning the lady's name. He could do no less. So far as the shooting was concerned, he had had no weapon with which to shoot. His gun had been stolen that very day, and had not been recovered. The defense will offer no testimony, declared Caxton, at the result of the conference. The justice held the prisoner to the grand jury, and fixed the bond at ten thousand dollars. Graciela's information had not been without its effect, and when Caxton suggested that he could still secure bail, he had little difficulty in inducing Ben to accept Colonel French's friendly offices. The bail bond was made out and signed, and the prisoner released. Caxton took Ben to his office after the hearing. There Ben met the colonel, thanked him for his aid and friendship, and apologized for his former rudeness. "'I was in a bad way, sir,' he said, and hardly knew what I was doing. But I know I didn't shoot bark fetters, and never thought of such a thing. "'I'm sure you didn't, my boy,' said the colonel, laying his hand in familiar fashion upon the young fellow's shoulder. "'And we'll prove it before we quit. There are some ladies who believe the same thing, and would like to hear you say it.' "'Thank you, sir,' said Ben. "'I should like to tell them, but I shouldn't want to enter their house until I am cleared of this charge.' I think too much of them to expose them to any remarks about harboring a man out on bail for a penitentiary offense. I'll write to them, sir, and thank them for their trust and friendship. And you can tell them for me, if you will, that I'll come to see them when not only I, but everybody else can say that I am fit to go. Your feelings do you credit, returned the colonel warmly, and however much they would like to see you, I'm sure the ladies will appreciate your delicacy. As your friend and theirs, you must permit me to serve you further, whenever the opportunity offers, until this affair is finished. Ben thanked the colonel from a full heart, and went back to Mink Run, where, in the effort to catch up the plantation work, which had fallen behind in his absence, he sought to forget the prison atmosphere and lose the prison pallor. The disgrace of having been in jail was indelible, and the danger was by no means over. The sympathy of his friends would have been priceless to him, but to remain away from them would be not only the honorable course to pursue, but a just punishment for his own folly. For Graciela, after all, was only a girl, a young girl, and scarcely yet to be judged harshly for her actions, while he was a man grown, who knew better, and had not acted according to his lights. Three days after Ben Dudley's release on bail, Clarendon was treated to another sensation. Former Constable Haynes, now employed as an overseer at Fetter's convict farm, while driving in a buggy to Clarendon where he spent his off-duty spells, was shot from ambush near Mink Run, and his right arm shattered in such a manner as to require amputation. End of section 28. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 29 of the Colonel's Dream. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Colonel's Dream by Charles Chestnut. Section 29, Chapter 29. Colonel French's interest in Ben Dudley's affairs had not been permitted to interfere with his various enterprises. Work on the chief of these, the cotton mill, had gone steadily forward, with only occasional delays, incident to the delivery of material, the weather, and the health of the workmen, which was often uncertain for a day or two after payday. The colored foreman of the bricklayers had been seriously ill. His place had been filled by a white man under whom the walls were rising rapidly. Jim Green, the foreman whom the colonel had formerly discharged, and the two white bricklayers who had quit at the same time, applied for reinstatement. The colonel took the two men on again, but declined to restore Green, who had been discharged for insubordination. Green went away swearing vengeance. At Clay Johnson's saloon he hurled invectives at the colonel, to all who would listen, and with anger and bad whiskey soon worked himself into a frame of mind that was ripe for any mischief. Some of his utterances were reported to the colonel, who was not without friends, the wealthy seldom are. 
but he paid no particular attention to them except to keep a watchman at the mill at night, lest this hostility should seek out an outlet in some attempt to injure the property. The precaution was not amiss, for once the watchman shot at a figure prowling about the mill. The lesson was sufficient, apparently, for there was no immediate necessity to repeat it. The shooting of Haynes, while not so sensational as that of Barclay Fetters, had given rise to considerable feeling against Ben Dudley. That two young men should quarrel and exchange shots would not ordinarily have been a subject of extended remark, but two attempts at assassination constituted a much graver affair. That Dudley was responsible for this second assault was the generally accepted opinion. Fetter's friends and hirelings were openly hostile to young Dudley, and Haynes had been heard to say in his cups at Clay Jackson's saloon that when young Dudley was tried and convicted and sent to the penitentiary, he would be hired out to Fetter's who had the country contract, and that he, Haynes, would be delighted to have Dudley in his gang. The feeling against Dudley grew from day to day, and threats and bets were openly made that he would not live to be tried. There was no direct proof against him, but the moral and circumstantial evidence was quite sufficient to convict him in the eyes of Fetter's friends and supporters. The colonel was sometimes mentioned in connection with the affair as a friend of Ben's, for whom he had given bail, and as an enemy of Fetter's, to whom his antagonism in various ways had become a matter of public knowledge and interest. One day, while the excitement attending the second shooting was thus growing, Colonel French received through the mail a mysteriously worded note, vaguely hinting at some matter of public importance which the writer wished to communicate to him, and requesting a private interview for the purpose that evening at the Colonel's house. The note which had every internal evidence of sincerity was signed by Henry Taylor, the principal of the colored school, whom the Colonel had met several times in reference to the proposed industrial school. From the tenor of the communication, and what he knew about Taylor, the colonel had no doubt that the matter was one of importance, at least not one to be dismissed without examination. He thereupon stepped into Caxton's office and wrote an answer to the letter, fixing eight o'clock that evening as the time, and his own library as the place, of a meeting with the teacher. This letter he deposited in the post office personally. It was only a step from Caxton's office. Upon coming out of the post office, he saw the teacher standing on an opposite corner. When the colonel had passed out of sight, Taylor crossed the street, entered the post office, and soon emerged with the letter. He had given no sign that he saw the colonel, but it looked rather ostentatiously the other way when that gentleman had glanced in his direction. At the appointed hour, there was a light step on the colonel's piazza. The colonel was on watch and opened the door himself, ushering Taylor into his library a very handsome and comfortable room, the door of which he carefully closed behind them. The teacher looked around cautiously. Are we alone, sir? Yes, entirely so. And can anyone hear us? No. What have you got to tell me? Colonel French, replied the other, I'm in a hard situation, and I want you to promise that you'll never let on to anybody that I told you what I'm going to say. All right, Mr. Taylor if it is a proper promise to make. You can trust my discretion. Yes, sir. I'm sure I can. We colored folks, sir, are often accused of trying to shield criminals of our own race or of not helping the officers of the law to catch them. Maybe we does, sir, he said, lapsing into his earnestness, into bad grammar. Maybe we does sometimes, but not without reason. What reason? asked the colonel. Well, sir, for the reason that we ain't always sure that a colored man will get a fair trial, or any trial at all, or that he'll get a just sentence after he's been tried. We have no hand in making the laws or enforcing them. We are not summoned on jury, and yet we're asked to do the work of constables and sheriffs who are paid for arresting criminals and for protecting them from mobs, which they don't do. I have no doubt every word you say is true, Mr. Taylor, and such a state of things is unjust, and will some day be different, if I can help make it so. But nevertheless, all good citizens, whatever their color, ought to help preserve peace and good order. Yes, sir, so they ought, and I want to do just that. I want to cooperate, and a whole heap of us want to cooperate with the good white people 
to keep down crime and lawlessness. I know there's good white people who want to see justice done, but they ain't always strong enough to run things. And if any one of us colored folks tells on another one, he's liable to lose all his friends. But I believe, sir, that I can trust you to save me harmless and to see that nothing more than justice is done to the colored man. Yes, Taylor, you can trust me to do all that I can, and I think I have considerable influence. Now what's on your mind? Do you know who shot Haynes and Mr. Fetters? Well, sir, you're a mighty good guesser. It ain't so much Mr. Fetters and Mr. Haynes I'm thinking about, for that place down the country is a hell on earth, and they're the devils that run it. But there's a friend of yours in trouble for something he didn't do, and I wouldn't stand for an innocent man being sent to the penitentiary, though many a poor Negro has been. Yes, sir. I know that Mr. Ben Dudley didn't shoot them two white men. So do I, rejoined the colonel. Who did? It was Bud Johnson, the man you tried to get away from Mr. Fetters. Your coachman told us about it, sir. And we know how good a friend of ours you are from what you've promised us about the school. And I wanted you to know, sir, you are our friend and have showed confidence in us. And I wanted to prove to you that we are not ungrateful and that we want to be good citizens. I had heard, said the colonel, that Johnson had escaped and left the county. So he had, sir but he came back. They had abused him down at that place till he swore he'd kill every one that had anything to do with him. It was Mr. Turner he shot at the first time, and he hit young Mr. Fetters by accident. He stole a gun from old Mr. Dudley's place at Mink Run, shot Mr. Fetters with it, and has kept it ever since, and shot Mr. Haynes with it. I suppose they'd have catched him before if it hadn't been for suspecting young Mr. Dudley. "'Where is Johnson now?' asked the colonel. "'He's hiding in an old log cabin down by the swamp, back of Mink Run. "'He sleeps in the daytime and goes out at night to get food "'and watch for white men from Mr. Fetter's place. "'Does his wife know where he is?' "'No, sir. He ain't never let her know.' "'By the way, Taylor,' asked the colonel, "'how do you know all this?' "'Well, sir,' replied the teacher, with something which, in an uneducated negro, would have been a very pronounced chuckle. <laughs> There's mighty little going on round here that I don't find out sooner or later. Taylor, said the colonel, rising to terminate the interview, you have rendered a public service, have proved yourself a good citizen, and have relieved Mr. Dudley of serious embarrassment. I will see that steps are taken to apprehend Johnson, and will keep your participation in the matter secret since you think it would hurt your influence with your people. And I promise you faithfully that every effort shall be made to see that Johnson has a fair trial, and no more than a just punishment. He gave the Negro his hand. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, replied the teacher, returning the colonel's clasp. If there were more white men like you, the colored folks would have no more trouble. The colonel let Taylor out and watched him as he looked cautiously up and down the street to see that he was not observed. That colored folks or any other kind should ever cease to have trouble was a vain imagining. But the teacher had made a well-founded complaint of injustice which ought to be capable of correction, and he had performed a public-spirited action, even though he had felt constrained to do it in a clandestine manner. About his own part in the affair, the colonel was troubled. It was becoming clear to him that the task he had undertaken was no light one. Not the task of apprehending Johnson and clearing Dudley, but that of leavening the inert mass of Clarendon with the leaven of enlightenment. With the best of intentions and hoping to save a life, he had connived at turning a murderer loose upon the community. It was true that the community, through unjust laws, had made him a murderer. But it was no part of the colonel's plan to foster or promote evil passions or to help the victims of the law make reprisals. His aim was to bring about, by better laws and more liberal ideas, peace, harmony, and universal goodwill. There was a colossal work for him to do, and for all whom he could enlist with him in this cause. The very standards of right and wrong had been confused by the race issue, and must be set right by the patient appeal to reason and humanity. Primitive passions and private vengeance must be subordinated to law and order and the higher good. 
a new body of thought must be built up, in which stress must be laid upon the eternal verities, in the light of which difficulties which now seemed unsurmountable would be gradually overcome. But this halcyon period was yet afar off, and the colonel roused himself to the duty of the hour. With the best intentions he had let loose upon the community, in a questionable way, a desperate character. It was no less than his plain duty to put the man under restraint. To rescue from fetters a man whose life was threatened was one thing. To leave a murderer at large, now, would be to endanger innocent lives, and imperil Ben Dudley's future. The arrest of Bud Johnson brought an end to the case against Ben Dudley. The prosecuting attorney, who was under political obligations to Fetters, seemed reluctant to dismiss the case, until Johnson's guilt should have been legally proved. But the result of the Negro's preliminary hearing rendered this position no longer tenable. The case against Ben was nulled, and he could now hold his head up as a free man with no stain upon his character. Indeed, the reaction in his favor, as one unjustly indicted, went far to wipe out from the public mind the impression that he was a drunkard and a rowdy. It was recalled that he was of good family, and that his forebears had rendered valuable service to the state, and that he had never been seen to drink before, or known to be in a fight, but that on the contrary he was quiet and harmless to a fault. Indeed, the Clarendon public would have admired a little more spirit in a young man, even to the extent of condoning an occasional lapse into license. There was sincere rejoicing at the Treadwell house when Ben, now free in mind, went around to see the ladies. Miss Laura was warmly sympathetic and congratulatory, and Graciela, tearfully happy, tried to make up by a sweet humility, through which shone the true womanliness of a hitherto undeveloped character, for the past stings and humiliations to which her selfish caprice had subjected her lover. Ben resumed his visits if not with quite their former frequency, and it was only a day or two later that the colonel found him and Graciela, with his own boy Phil, grouped in familiar fashion on the steps, where Ben was demonstrating with some pride of success the operation of his model, into which he was feeding cotton when the colonel came up. The colonel stood a moment and looked at the machine. "'It's quite ingenious,' he said. "'Explain the principle.' Ben described the mechanism in brief, well-chosen words which conveyed the thought clearly and concisely, and revealed a fine mind for mechanics, and at the same time an absolute lack of technical knowledge. It would never be of any use, sir, he said, at the end, for everybody has the other kind. But it's another way, and I think a better. It is clever, said the colonel thoughtfully, as he went into the house. The colonel had not changed his mind at all since asking Miss Laura to be his wife. The glow of happiness still warmed her cheek, the spirit of youth still lingered in her eyes and in her smile. He might go a thousand miles before meeting a woman who would please him more, take better care of Phil, or preside with more dignity over his household. Her simple grace would adapt itself to wealth as easily as it had accommodated itself to poverty. It would be a pleasure to travel with her to new scenes and new places to introduce her into a wider world, to see her expand in the generous sunlight of ease and freedom from responsibility. True to his promise, the colonel made every effort to see that Bud Johnson should be protected against mob violence, and given a fair trial. There was some intemperate talk about the partisans of Fetters, and an ominous gathering upon the streets the day after the arrest. But Judge Miller, of the Beaver County Circuit, who was in Clarendon that day, used his influence to discountenance any disorder, and promised a speedy trial of the prisoner. The crime was not the worst of crimes, and there was no excuse for riot or lynch law. The accused could not escape his just punishment. As a result of the judge's efforts, supplemented by the colonels and those of Dr. Price and several ministers, any serious fear of disorder was removed, and a handful of Fetter's guards, who had come up from his convict farm, and foregathered with some choice spirits of the town at Clay Jackson's saloon, went back without attempting to do what they had avowedly come to town to accomplish. End of section 29. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 30 of The Colonel's Dream. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Colonel's Dream by Charles Chestnut. Section 30. Chapter 30. One morning the Colonel, while overseeing the work at the new mill building, stepped on the rounded handle of a chisel, which had been left lying carelessly on the floor, and slipped and fell, spraining his ankle severely. He went home in his buggy, which was at the mill, and sent for Dr. Price, who put his foot in a plaster bandage and ordered him to keep quiet for a week. Peter and Phil went around to the Treadwells to inform the ladies of the accident. On reaching the house after the accident, the colonel had taken off his coat and sent Peter to bring him one from the closet off his bedroom. When the colonel put on the coat, he felt some papers in the inside pocket, and, taking them out, recognized the two old letters he had taken from the lining of his desk several months before. The housekeeper, in a moment of unusual zeal, had discovered and mended the tear in the sleeve, and Peter had by chance selected this particular coat to bring to his master. When Peter started, with Phil, to go to the Treadwells, the colonel gave him the two letters. Give these, he said, to Miss Laura, and tell her I found them in the old desk. It was not long before Miss Laura came, with Graciela, to call on the colonel. When they had expressed the proper sympathy and had been assured that the hurt was not dangerous, Miss Laura spoke of another matter. Henry, she said with an air of suppressed excitement, I have made a discovery. I don't quite know what it means or whether it amounts to anything, but in one of the envelopes you sent me just now there was a paper signed by Mr. Fetters. I do not know how it could have been left in the desk. We had searched it years ago in every nook and cranny and found nothing. The colonel explained the circumstances of his discovery of the papers, but prudently refrained from mentioning how long ago they had taken place. Miss Laura handed him a thin, oblong, yellowish slip of paper, which had been folded in the middle. It was a printed form, upon which several words had been filled in with a pen. It was enclosed in this, she said, handing him another paper. The colonel took the papers and glanced over them. Mother thinks, said Miss Laura anxiously, that they are the papers we were looking for, that proved that Fetters was in father's debt. The colonel had been thinking rapidly. The papers were, indeed, a promissory note from Fetters to Mr. Treadwell, and a contract and memorandum of certain joint transactions in turpentine and cotton futures. The note was dated twenty years back. Had it been produced at the time of Mr. Treadwell's death, it would not have been difficult to collect, and would have meant to his survivors the difference between poverty and financial independence. Now it was barred by the lapse of time. Miss Laura was waiting in eager expectation. Outwardly calm, her eyes were bright, her cheeks were glowing, her bosom rose and fell excitedly. Could he tell her that this seemingly fortunate accident was merely the irony of fate, a mere cruel reminder of a former misfortune? No, she could not believe it. It has made me happy, Henry, she said while he still kept his eyes bent on the papers to conceal his perplexity. It has made me very happy to think that I may not come to you empty-handed. Dear woman, he thought, you shall not. If the note is not good, it shall be made good. Laura, he said aloud, I am no lawyer, but Caxton shall look at these today, and I shall be very much mistaken if they do not bring you a considerable sum of money. Say nothing about them, however, until Caxton reports. He will be here to see me today, and by tomorrow you shall have his opinion. Miss Laura went away with a radiantly hopeful face, and as she and Graciela went down the street, the colonel noted that her step was scarcely less springy than her niece's. It was worth the amount of Fetter's old note to make her happy, and since he meant to give her all that she might want, what better way than to do it by means of this bit of worthless paper? It would be a harmless deception, and it would save the pride of three gentlewomen, with whom pride was not a disease to poison and scorch and blister, but an inspiration to courtesy and kindness and right living. Such a pride was worth cherishing, 
even at a sacrifice, which was, after all, no sacrifice. He had already sent word to Caxton of his accident, requesting him to call at the house on other business. Caxton came in the afternoon, and when the matter concerning which he had come had been disposed of, Colonel French produced Fetter's note. Caxton, he said, I wish to pay this note and let it seem to have come from Fetter's. Caxton looked at the note. Why should you pay it, he asked. I mean, he added, noting a change in the colonel's expression, why shouldn't Fetters pay it? Because it is outlawed, he replied, and we could hardly expect him to pay for anything he didn't have to pay. The statute of limitations runs against it after fifteen years, and it's older than that, much older than that. Caxton made a rapid mental calculation. That is the law in New York, he said, but here the statute doesn't begin to run for twenty years. The twenty years for which this note was given expires today. Then it is good? demanded the colonel, looking at his watch. It is good, said Caxton, provided there is no defense to it except the statute, and provided I can file a petition on it in the county clerk's office by four o'clock, the time at which the office closes. It is now twenty minutes to four. Can you make it? I'll try. Caxton, since his acquaintance with Colonel French, had learned something more about the value of half an hour than he had ever before appreciated, and here was an opportunity to test his knowledge. He literally ran the quarter of a mile that lay between the Colonel's residence and the courthouse, to the open-eyed astonishment of those whom he passed, some of whom wondered whether he was crazy, and others whether he had committed a crime. He dashed into the clerk's office, seized a pen and the first piece of paper handy, and began to write a petition. The clerk had stepped into the hall, and when he came leisurely in at three minutes to four, Caxton discovered that he had written his petition on the back of a blank marriage license. He folded it, ran his pen through the printed matter, endorsed it as State of Treadwell versus Fetters, signed it with the name of Ellen Treadwell as executrix, by himself as her attorney, swore to it before the clerk, and handed it to that official, who raised his eyebrows as soon as he saw the endorsement. Now, Mr. Monroe, said Caxton, if you'll enter that on the docket now, as of today, I'll be obliged to you. I'd rather have the transaction all finished up while I wait. Your fee needn't wait the termination of the suit. I'll pay it now and take a receipt for it. The clerk whistled to himself as he read the petition in order to make the entry. That's an old-timer, he said. It'll make the old man cuss. Yes, said Caxton. Do me a favor, and don't say anything about it for a day or two. I don't think the suit will ever come to trial. End of Section 30 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Section 31 of The Colonel's Dream This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White The Colonel's Dream by Charles Chestnut Section 31, Chapter 31 On the day following these events, the Colonel, on the arm of old Peter, hobbled out upon his front porch, and, seating himself in a big rocking chair in front of which a cushion had been adjusted for his injured ankle, composed himself to read some arrears of mail which had come in the day before, and over which he had only glanced casually. When he was comfortably settled, Peter and Phil walked down the steps, upon the lowest of which they seated themselves. The colonel had scarcely begun to read before he called to the old man. Peter, he said, I wish you'd go upstairs and look in my room and bring me a couple of light-colored cigars from the box on my bureau. The mild ones, you know, Peter. Yes, sir. I know, sir. The mild ones. Them with the gold bands round em. Now you stay right here, child, till Peter come back. Peter came up the steps and disappeared in the doorway. The colonel opened a letter from Kirby, 
in which that energetic and versatile gentleman assured the colonel that he had evolved a great scheme, in which there were millions for those who would go into it. He had already interested Mrs. Jervis, who had stated she would be governed by what the colonel did in the matter. The letter went into some detail upon this subject, and then drifted off into club and social gossip. Several of the colonel's friends had inquired particularly about him. One had regretted the loss to their whist table. Another wanted the refusal of his box at the opera, if he were not coming back for the winter. "'I think you're missed in a certain quarter, old fellow. I know a lady who would be more than delighted to see you. I am invited to her house, to dinner, ostensibly to talk about our scheme, in reality to talk about you. But this is all by the way. The business is the thing. Take my proposition under advisement.' We all made money together before. We can make it again. My option has ten days to run. Wire me before it is up what reply to make. I know what you'll say, but I want your ipse dixit. The colonel knew, too, what his reply would be, and that it would be very different from Kirby's anticipation. He would write it, he thought, next day, so that Kirby should not be kept in suspense or so that he might have time to enlist other capital in the enterprise. The colonel felt really sorry to disappoint his good friends. He would write and inform Kirby of his plans, including that of his approaching marriage. He had folded the letter and laid it down, and had picked up a newspaper, when Peter returned with the cigars and a box of matches. "'Mas Henry?' he asked. "'What's going with the child?' "'Phil,' replied the colonel looking toward the step from which the boy had disappeared. I suppose he went round the house. Mas Phil! Oh, Mas Phil! called the old man. There was no reply. Peter looked round the corner of the house, but Phil was nowhere visible. The old man went round to the back yard and called again, but did not find the child. Ah, here's the train coming. I specs he's going up to the railroad track, he said when he had returned to the front of the house. "'I'll run up there and fetch him back.' "'Yes, do, Peter,' returned the colonel. "'He's probably all right, but you'd better see about him.' Little Phil, seeing his father absorbed in the newspaper and not wishing to disturb him, had amused himself by going to the gate and looking down the street toward the railroad track. He had been doing this scarcely a moment when he saw a black cat come out of a neighbor's gate and go down the street. Phil instantly recalled Uncle Peter's story of the black cat. Perhaps this was the same one. Phil had often been warned about the railroad. "'Keep away from that railroad track, honey,' the old man had repeated more than once. "'It's as dangerous as a gun, and a gun is dangerous without lock, stock, or barrel. I knowed a man once would beat his wife to death with a ramrod, and was hung for it in an old field down by the haunted house.' That gun couldn't hold powder nor shot, but was dangerous enough to kill two folks. So you just better keep away from that railroad track, child. But Phil was a child with the making of a man, and the wisest of men sometimes forget. For the moment, Phil saw nothing but the cat and wished for nothing more than to talk to it. So Phil, unperceived by the colonel, set out to overtake the black cat. The cat seemed in no hurry, and Phil had very nearly caught up with him, or her, as the case might be, when the black cat, having reached the railroad siding, walked under a flat car which stood there, and, leaping to one of the truck bars, composed itself, presumably, for a nap. In order to get close enough to the cat for conversational purposes, Phil stooped under the overhanging end of the car and kneeled down beside the truck. "'Kitty! Kitty!' he called invitingly. The black cat opened her big yellow eyes with every evidence of lazy amiability. Peter shuffled toward the corner as fast as his rickety old limbs would carry him. When he reached the corner, he saw a car standing on the track. There was a brakeman at one end, holding a coupling link in one hand and a coupling pin in the other, his eye on an engine and train of cars only a rod or two away advancing to pick up the single car. At the same moment, Peter caught sight of little Phil kneeling under the car at the other end. Peter shouted, 
but the brakeman was absorbed in his own task, which required close attention in order to assure his own safety. The engineer on the cab at the other end of the train saw an old negro excitedly gesticulating and pulled a lever mechanically, but too late to stop the momentum of the train, which was not equipped with air brakes, even if these would have proved effective to stop it in so short a distance. Just before the two cars came together, Peter threw himself forward to seize the child. As he did so, the cat sprang from the truck bar. The old man stumbled over the cat and fell across the rail. The car moved only a few feet, but quite far enough to work injury. A dozen people, including the train crew, quickly gathered. Willing hands drew them out and laid them upon the grass under the spreading elm at the corner of the street. A judge, a merchant, and a negro laborer lifted old Peter's body as tenderly as though it had been that of a beautiful woman. The colonel, somewhat uneasy, he scarcely knew why, had started to limp painfully toward the corner when he was met by a messenger who informed him of the accident. Forgetting his pain, he hurried to the scene, only to find his heart's delight lying pale, bleeding, and unconscious beside the old negro who had sacrificed his life to save him. A doctor, who had been hastily summoned, pronounced Peter dead. Phil showed no superficial injury, save a cut upon his head, from which the bleeding was soon stanched. A negro's strong arms bore the child to the house, while the bystanders remained about Peter's body until the arrival of Major McLean, recently elected coroner, who had been promptly notified of the accident. Within a few minutes after the officer's appearance, a jury was summoned from among the bystanders. The evidence of the trainmen and several other witnesses was taken, and a verdict of accidental death rendered. There was no suggestion of blame attaching to anyone. It had been an accident, pure and simple, which ordinary and reasonable prudence could not have foreseen. By the colonel's command, the body of his old servant was then conveyed to the house and laid out in the front parlor. Every hour, every token of respect, should be paid to his remains. End of section 31. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 32 of The Colonel's Dream. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. THE COLONEL'S DREAM by Charles Chestnut Section 32, Chapter 32 Meanwhile, the colonel, forgetting his own hurt, hovered with several physicians, among them Dr. Price, around the bedside of his child. The slight cut upon his head, the physicians declared, was not, of itself, sufficient to account for the rapid sinking which set in shortly after the boy's removal to the house. There had evidently been some internal injury, the nature of which could not be ascertained. Phil remained unconscious for several hours, but toward the end of the day opened his blue eyes and fixed them upon his father, who was sitting by the bedside. Papa, he said, am I going to die? No, no, Phil, said his father hopefully. You are going to get well in a few days, I hope. Phil was silent for a moment and looked around him curiously. He gave no sign of being in pain. Is Miss Laura here? Yes, Phil. She's in the next room, and will be here in a moment. At that instant, Miss Laura came in and kissed him. The caress gave him pleasure, and he smiled sweetly in return. Papa, was Uncle Peter hurt? Yes, Phil. Where is he, Papa? Was he hurt badly? He is lying in another room, Phil, but he is not in any pain. Papa, said Phil, after a pause, if I should die, and if Uncle Peter should die, you'll remember your promise to bury him near me, won't you, dear? Yes, Phil, he said, but you are not going to die. But Phil died, dozing off into a peaceful sleep in which he passed quietly away with a smile upon his face. It required all the father's fortitude to sustain the blow, with the added agony of self-reproach that he himself had been unwittingly the cause of it. 
Had he not sent old Peter into the house, the child would not have been left alone. Had he kept his eye upon Phil until Peter's return, the child would not have strayed away. He had neglected his child, while the bruised and broken old black man in the room below had given his life to save him. He could do nothing now to show the child his love or Peter his gratitude, and the old man had neither wife nor child in whom the colonel's bounty might find an object. But he would do what he could. He would lay his child's body in the old family lot in the cemetery, among the bones of his ancestors, and there too, close at hand, old Peter should have honorable sepulture. It was his due, and would be the fulfillment of little Phil's last request. The child was laid out in the parlor, amid a mass of flowers. Miss Laura, for love of him and of the colonel, with her own hands, prepared his little body for the last sleep. The undertaker, who hovered around, wished, with a conventional sense of fitness, to remove old Peter's body to a back room. But the colonel said no. They died together. Together they shall lie here, and they shall be buried together. He gave instructions as to the location of the graves in the cemetery lot. The undertaker looked thoughtful. "'I hope, sir,' said the undertaker, "'there will be no objection. "'It's not customary. "'There's a colored graveyard. "'You might put up a nice tombstone there. "'And you've been away from here a long time, sir.' "'If anyone objects,' said the colonel, "'send him to me. "'The lot is mine, and I shall do with it as I like.' My great-great-grandfather gave the cemetery to the town. Old Peter's skin was black, but his heart was white as any man's. And when a man reaches the grave, he is not far from God, who is no respecter of persons, and in whose presence, on the judgment day, many a white man shall be black, and many a black man white. The funeral was set for the following afternoon. The graves were to be dug in the morning, the undertaker, whose business was dependent upon public favor, and who therefore shrank from any step which might affect his own popularity, let it be quietly known that Colonel French had given directions to bury Peter in Oak Cemetery. It was inevitable that there should be some question raised about so novel a proceeding. The color line in Clarendon, as in all southern towns, was, on the surface at least, rigidly drawn, and extended from the cradle to the grave. No Negro's body had ever profaned the sacred soil of Oak Cemetery. The Protestants laid the matter before the cemetery trustees, and a private meeting was called in the evening to consider the proposed interment. White and black worshipped the same God in different churches. There had been a time when colored people filled the galleries of the white churches, and white ladies had instilled into black children the principles of religion and good morals. But as white and black had grown nearer to each other in condition, they had grown farther apart in feeling. It was difficult for the poor lady, for instance, to patronize the children of the well-to-do Negro or mulatto. Nor was the latter inclined to look up to white people who had started, in his memory, from a position but little higher than his own. In an era of change, the benefits gained thereby seemed scarcely to offset the difficulties of readjustment. The situation was complicated by a sense of injury on both sides. Cherishing their theoretical equality of citizenship, which they could neither enforce nor forget, the Negroes resented, noisily or silently, as prudence dictated, its contemptuous denial by the whites. And these, viewing this shadowy equality as an insult to themselves, had sought by all the machinery of local law to emphasize and perpetuate their own superiority. The very word equality was an offense. Society went back to Egypt and India for its models. To break caste was a greater sin than to break any or all of the Ten Commandments. White and colored children studied the same books in different schools. White and black people rode on the same trains in separate cars. Living side by side and meeting day by day, the law, made and administered by white men, had built a wall between them, and white and black buried their dead in separate graveyards. Not until they reached God's presence could they stand side by side in any relation of equality. There was a Negro graveyard in Clarendon where, as a matter of course, the colored dead were buried. It was not an ideal locality, 
The land was low and swampy, and graves must be used quickly, ere the water collected in them. The graveyard was unfenced, and vagrant cattle browsed upon its rank herbage. The embankment of the railroad encroached upon one side of it, and the passing engines sifted cinders and ashes over the graves. But no negro had ever thought of burying his dead elsewhere, and if their cemetery was not well kept up, whose fault was it but their own? The proposition, therefore, of a white man, even of Colonel French's standing, to bury a negro in Oak Cemetery, was bound to occasion comment, if nothing more. There was indeed more. Several citizens objected to the profanation, and laid their protest before the mayor, who quietly called a meeting of the Board of Cemetery Trustees, of which he was the chairman. The trustees were five in number. The board, with the single exception of the mayor, was self-perpetuating, and the members had been chosen, as vacancies occurred by death at long intervals, from among the aristocracy, who had always controlled it. The mayor, a member and chairman of the board by virtue of his office, had sprung from the same class as Fetters, that of the aspiring poor whites, who, freed from the moral incubus of slavery, had by force of numbers and ambition secured political control of the state, and relegated not only the Negroes but the old master class to political obscurity. A shrewd, capable man was the mayor, who despised Negroes and distrusted aristocrats, and had the courage of his convictions. He represented in the meeting a protesting element of the community. Gentlemen, he said, Colonel French has ordered this Negro to be buried in Oak Cemetery. We all appreciate the Colonel's worth and what he is doing for the town, but he has lived at the North for many years and has got somewhat out of our way of thinking. We do not want to buy the prosperity of this town at the price of our principles. The attitude of the white people on the Negro question is fixed and determined for all time, and nothing can ever alter it. To bury this Negro in Oak Cemetery is against our principles. The mayor's statement of the rule is quite correct, replied old General Thornton, a member of the board, and not open to question. But all rules have their exceptions. It was against the law for some years before the war to manumit a slave. But an exception to that salutary rule was made in case a Negro should render some great service to the state or the community. You will recall that when, in a sister state, a Negro climbed the steep roof of St. Michael's Church and, at the risk of his own life, saved that historic structure, the pride of Charleston, from destruction by fire, the municipality granted him his freedom. And we all remember, said Mr. Darden, another of the trustees, we all remember, at least I'm sure General Thornton does, old Sally, who used to belong to the McRae family, and was a member of the Presbyterian Church, and who, because of her age and infirmities, she was hard of hearing and too old to climb the stairs to the gallery, was given a seat in front of the pulpit on the main floor. That was all very well, replied the mayor stoutly, when the Negroes belonged to you and never questioned your authority. But times are different now. They think themselves as good as we are. We had them pretty well in hand until Colonel French came around, with his schools and his high wages, and now they're getting so fat and sassy that there'll soon be no living with them. The last election did something, but we'll have to do something more, and that soon, to keep them in their places. There's one in jail now, alive, who has shot and disfigured and nearly killed two good white men. And such an example of social equality as burying one in a white graveyard will demoralize them still further. We must preserve the purity and prestige of our race, and we can only do it by keeping the Negroes down. After all, said another member, the purity of our race is not apt to suffer very seriously from the social equality of a graveyard. And old Peter will be pretty effectually kept down wherever he is buried, added another. These sallies provoked a smile which lightened the tension. A member suggested that Colonel French be sent for. It seems a pity to disturb him in his grief, said another. It's only a couple of squares, suggested another. Let's call in a body and pay our respects. We can bring up the matter incidentally while there. The muscles of the mayor's chin hardened. Colonel French has never been at my house, he said, and I shouldn't care to seem to intrude. 
"'Come on, Mayor,' said Mr. Darden, taking the official by the arm. "'These fine distinctions are not becoming in the presence of death. "'The Colonel will be glad to see you.' "'The Mayor could not resist this mark of intimacy "'on the part of one of the old aristocracy, "'and walked somewhat proudly through the street, "'arm in arm with Mr. Darden. "'They paid their respects to the Colonel, "'who was bearing up with the composure "'to be expected of a man of strong will "'and forceful character.' under a grief of which he was exquisitely sensible. Touched by a strong man's emotion which nothing could conceal, no one had the heart to mention, in the presence of the dead, the object of their visit, and they went away without giving the colonel any inkling that his course had been seriously criticized. Nor was the meeting resumed after they left the house. Even the mayor seemed content to let the matter go by default. End of section 32 Recording by James K. White Chula Vista. Section 33 of The Colonel's Dream. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Colonel's Dream by Charles Chestnut. Section 33. CHAPTER 33 Fortune favored Caxton in the matter of the note. Fetters was in Clarendon the following morning. Caxton saw him passing, called him into his office, and produced the note. "'That's no good,' said Fetters contemptuously. "'It was outlawed yesterday. I suppose you allowed I'd forgotten it. On the contrary, I've a memorandum of it in my pocketbook.' and I struck it off the list last night. I always pay my lawful debts when they're properly demanded. If this note had been presented yesterday, I'd have paid it. Today it's too late. It ain't a lawful debt. Do you really mean to say, Mr. Fetters, that you have deliberately robbed those poor women of this money all these years and are not ashamed of it? Not even when you're found out? And that you're not going to take refuge behind the statute? "'Now see here, Mr. Caxton,' returned Fetters, without apparent emotion. "'You want to be careful about the language you use. "'I might sue you for slander. "'You're a young man that hopes to have a future and live in this county, "'where I expect to live and have law business done "'long after some of your present clients have moved away. "'I didn't owe the estate of John Treadwell one cent. "'You ought to be lawyer enough to know that.' He owed me money and paid me with a note. I collected the note. I owed him money and paid it with a note. Who ever heard of anybody's paying a note that wasn't presented? It's a poor argument, Mr. Fetters. You would have let those ladies starve to death before you would have come forward and paid that debt. They've never asked me for charity, so I wasn't called on to offer it. And you know now, don't you, that if I'd paid the amount of that note and then it had turned up afterward in somebody else's hands, I'd have had to pay it over again, now wouldn't I? Caxton could not deny it. Fetters had robbed the Treadwell estate, but his argument was unanswerable. Yes, said Caxton, I suppose you would. I'm sorry for the women, said Fetters, and I've stood ready to pay that note all these years, and it ain't my fault that it hasn't been presented. Now it's outlawed, and you couldn't expect a man to just give away that much money. It ain't a lawful debt, and the law's good enough for me. You're awfully sorry for the ladies, aren't you? said Caxton, with thinly veiled sarcasm. I surely am. I'm honestly sorry for them. And you'd pay the note if you had to, wouldn't you? asked Caxton. I surely would. As I say, I always pay my legal debts. "'All right,' said Caxton triumphantly. "'Then you'll pay this. "'I filed suit against you yesterday, "'which takes the case out of the statute.' "'Fetters concealed his discomfiture. "'Well,' he said, with quiet malignity, "'I've nothing more to say till I consult my lawyer. "'But I want to tell you one thing. "'You are ruining a fine career "'by standing in with this Colonel French. "'I hear his son was killed today.' You can tell him, I say, it's a judgment on him, for I hold him responsible for my son's condition. He came down here and tried to demoralize the labor market, 
he put false notions in the niggers' heads. Then he got to meddling with my business, trying to get away a nigger whose time I had bought. He insulted my agent, Turner, and came all the way down to Sycamore and tried to bully me into letting the nigger loose. And, of course, I wouldn't be bullied. Afterwards, when I offered to let the nigger go, the colonel wouldn't have it so. I shall always believe he bribed one of my men to get the nigger off and then turned him loose to run amuck among the white people and shoot my boy and my overseer. It was a low-down performance, and unworthy of a gentleman. No really white man would treat another white man so. You can tell him, I say, it's a judgment that's fallen on him today, and that it's not the last one, and that he'll be sorrier yet that he didn't stay where he was with his nigger-loving notions, instead of coming back down here to make trouble for people that have grown up with the state and made it what it is. Caxton, of course, did not deliver the message. To do so would have been worse taste than Fetters had displayed in sending it. Having got the best of the encounter, Caxton had no objection to letting his defeated antagonist discharge his venom against the absent colonel, who would never know of it, and who was already breasting the waves of a sorrow so deep and so strong as to almost overwhelm him, for he had loved the boy. All his hopes had centered around this beautiful man-child, who had promised so much that was good. His own future had been planned with reference to him. Now he was dead, and the bereaved father gave way to his grief. End of section 33. Recording by James K. White. Chula Vista. Section 34 of The Colonel's Dream. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Colonel's Dream by Charles Chestnut. Section 34, Chapter 34. The funeral took place next day from the Episcopal Church in which communion the little boy had been baptized, and of which old Peter had always been a humble member, faithfully appearing every Sunday morning in his seat in the gallery long after the rest of his people had deserted it for churches of their own. On this occasion, Peter had, for the first time, a place on the main floor, a little to one side of the altar, in front of which, banked with flowers, stood the white velvet casket which contained all that was mortal of little Phil. The same beautiful sermon answered for both. In touching words, the rector, a man of culture, taste, and feeling, and a faithful servant of his master, spoke of the sweet young life brought to so untimely an end, and pointed the bereaved father to the best source of consolation. He paid a brief tribute to the faithful servant and humble friend, to whom, though black and lowly, the white people of the town were glad to pay this signal tribute of respect and appreciation for his heroic deed. The attendance at the funeral, while it might have been larger, was composed of the more refined and cultured of the townspeople, from whom, indeed, the church derived most of its membership and support, and the gallery overflowed with colored people whose hearts had warmed to the great honor thus paid to one of their race. Four young white men bore Phil's body, and the six pallbearers of old Peter were from among the best white people of the town. The double interment was made in Oak Cemetery. Simultaneously, both bodies were lowered to their last resting place. Simultaneously, ashes were consigned to ashes and dust to dust. The earth was heaped above the graves. The mound above Little Phil's was buried with flowers, and Old Peter's was not neglected. Beyond the cemetery walls, a few white men of the commoner sort watched the proceedings from a distance, and eyed with grim hostility the negroes who had followed the procession. They had no part nor parcel in this sentimental folly, nor did they approve of it. In fact, they disapproved of it very decidedly. Among them was the colonel's discharged foreman, Jim Green, who was pronounced in his denunciation. "'Colonel French is an enemy of his race,' he declared to his sympathetic following. He hires niggers when white men are idle, and pays them more than white men who work are earning, 
and now he's bearing them with white people. When the group around the grave began to disperse, the little knot of disgruntled spectators moved sullenly away. In the evening they might have been seen, most of them, around Clay Jackson's bar room. Turner, the foreman at Fetter's convict farm, was in town that evening, and Jackson's was his favorite haunt. For some reason Turner was more sociable than usual, and liquor flowed freely at his expense. There was a great deal of intemperate talk concerning the Negro in jail for shooting Haynes and young Fetters, and concerning Colonel French as the protector of Negroes and the enemy of white men. End of section 34. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 35 of The Colonel's Dream. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Colonel's Dream by Charles Chestnut. Section 35. Chapter 35. At the same time that the Colonel, dry-eyed and heavy-hearted, had returned to his empty house to nurse his grief, another series of events was drawing to a climax in the dilapidated house on Mink Run. Even while the preacher was saying the last words over little Phil's remains, old Malcolm Dudley's illness had taken a sudden and violent turn. He had been sinking for several days, but the decline had been gradual, and there had seemed no particular reason for alarm. But during the funeral exercises, Ben had begun to feel uneasy. Some obscure premonition warned him to hurry homeward. As soon as the funeral was over, he spoke to Dr. Price, who had been one of the pallbearers, and the doctor had promised to be at Mink Run in a little while. Ben rode home as rapidly as he could. As he went up the lane toward the house, a negro lad came forward to take charge of the tired horse, and Ben could see from the boy's expression that he had important information to communicate. "'Yo uncle's master's low, sir,' said the boy. "'You better go in and see him quick, or you'll be too late. "'Dain ain't nobody with him but old Aunt Viney.' Ben hurried into the house and to his uncle's room, where Malcolm Dudley lay dying. Outside, the sun was setting, and his red rays, shining through the trees into the open window, lit the stage for the last scene of this belated drama. When Ben entered the room, the sweat of death had gathered on the old man's brow, but his eyes, clear with the light of reason, were fixed upon old Viney, who stood by the bedside. The two were evidently so absorbed in their own thoughts as to be oblivious to anything else and neither of them paid the slightest attention to Ben, or to the scared negro lad who had followed him and stood outside the door. But marvelous to hear, Viney was talking, strangely, slowly, thickly, but passionately and distinctly. "'You had me whipped,' she said. "'Do you remember that? "'You had me whipped, whipped, whipped by a poor white dog I had despised and spurned. You had said that you loved me, and you had promised to free me, and you had me whipped. But I've had my revenge. Her voice shook with passion, a passion at which Ben wondered. That his uncle and she had once been young, he knew, and that their relations had once been closer than those of master and servant. But this outbreak of feeling from the wrinkled old mulatress seemed as strange and weird to Ben as though a stone image had waked to speech. Spellbound, he stood in the doorway and listened to this ghost of a voice long dead. Your uncle came with the money and left it, and went away. Only he and I knew where it was, but I never told you. I could have spoken at any time for twenty-five years, but I never told you. I have waited. I have waited for this moment. I have gone into the woods and fields and talked to myself by the hour that I might not forget how to talk, and I have waited my turn, and it is here and now. Ben hung breathlessly upon her words. He drew back beyond her range of vision 
lest she might see him, and the spell be broken. Now, he thought, she would tell where the gold was hidden. He came, she said, and left the gold, two heavy bags of it, and a letter for you. An hour later he came back and took it all away, except the letter. The money was here one hour, but in that hour you had me whipped, and for that you have spent twenty-five years in looking for nothing, something that was not here. I've had my revenge. For twenty-five years I've watched you look for nothing, have seen you waste your time, your property, your life, your mind, for nothing. For all, Mars Malcolm, you had me whipped by another man. A shadow of reproach crept into the old man's eyes, over which the mists of death were already gathering. Viney, he whispered, you have had your revenge, but I was sorry, Viney, for what I did, and you were not. And I forgive you, Viney, but you are unforgiven, even in the presence of death. His voice failed and his eyes closed for the last time. When she saw that he was dead, by a strange revulsion of feeling, the wall of outraged pride and hatred and revenge built upon one brutal and bitterly repented mistake and laboriously maintained for half a lifetime in her woman's heart that even slavery could not crush, crumbled and fell and let pass over it in one great and final flood the pent-up passions of the past. Bursting into tears, strange tears from eyes that had long forgot to weep, old Viney threw herself down upon her knees by the bedside and seizing old Malcolm's emaciated hand in both her own, covered it with kisses, fervent kisses, the ghosts of the passionate kisses of their distant youth. With a feeling that his presence was something like sacrilege, Ben stole away and left her with her dead, the dead master and the dead past, and thanked God that he lived in another age and had escaped this sin. As he wandered through the old house, a veil seemed to fall from his eyes. How old everything was, how shrunken and decayed. The sheen of the hidden gold had gilded the dilapidated old house, the neglected plantation, his own barren life. Now that it was gone, things appeared in their true light. Fortunately, he was young enough to retrieve much of what had been lost. When the old man was buried, he would settle the estate, sell the land, make some provision for Aunt Viney, and then, with what was left, go out into the world and try to make a place for himself and Graciela. For life intrudes its claims, even into the presence of death. When the doctor came, a little later, Ben went with him into the death chamber. Viney was still kneeling by her master's bedside, but strangely still and silent. The doctor laid his hand on hers and old Malcolm's, which had remained clasped together. They are both dead, he declared. I knew their story. My father told it to me many years ago. Ben related what he had overheard. I'm not surprised, said the doctor. My father attended her when she had the stroke, and after. He always maintained that Viney could speak, if she had wished to speak. End of section 35. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 36 of The Colonel's Dream. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. THE COLONEL'S DREAM by Charles Chestnut Section 36, Chapter 36 The colonel's eyes were heavy with grief that night, and yet he lay awake late, and with his sorrow were mingled many consoling thoughts. The people, his people, had been kind, aye, more than kind. Their warm hearts had sympathized with his grief. 
he had sometimes been impatient of their conservatism, their narrowness, their unreasoning pride of opinion. But in his bereavement, they had manifested a feeling that it would be beautiful to remember all the days of his life. All the people, white and black, had united to honor his dead. He had wished to help them, had tried already. He had loved the town as the home of his ancestors, which enshrined their ashes. He would make of it a monument to mark his son's resting place. His fight against fetters and what he represented should take on a new character. Henceforward, it should be a crusade to rescue from threatened barbarism the land which contained the tombs of his loved ones. Nor would he be alone in the struggle, which he now clearly foresaw would be a long one. The dear, good woman he had asked to be his wife could help him. He needed her clear spiritual vision, and in his lifelong sorrow he would need her sympathy and companionship, for she had loved the child and would share his grief. She knew the people better than he, and was in closer touch with them. She could help him in his schemes of benevolence, and suggest new ways to benefit the people. Phil's mother was buried far away, among her own people. Could he consult her, he felt sure she would prefer to remain there. Here she would be an alien note, and when Laura died, she could lie with them and still be in her own place. "'Have you heard the news, sir?' asked the housekeeper, when he came down to breakfast the next morning. "'No, Mrs. Hughes, what is it?' "'They lynched the negro who was in jail for shooting young Mr. Fetters and the other man.' The colonel hastily swallowed a cup of coffee and went downtown. It was only a short walk. Already there were excited crowds upon the street, discussing the events of the night. The colonel sought Caxton, who was just entering his office. "'They've done it,' said the lawyer. "'So I understand. When did it happen?' "'About one o'clock last night. A crowd came in from Sycamore, not all at once, but by twos and threes, and got together in Clay Johnson's saloon with Ben Green, your discharged foreman, and a lot of other riffraff, and went to the sheriff and took the keys, and took Johnson and carried him out to where the shooting was, and... Spare me the details. Is he dead? Yes. A rope, a tree, a puff of smoke, a flash of flame, or a barbaric orgy of fire and blood. What matter which? At the end, there was a lump of clay, and a hundred murderers where there had been one before. Can we do anything to punish this crime? We can try. And they tried. The colonel went to the sheriff. The sheriff said he had yielded to force, but he never would have dreamed of shooting to defend a worthless negro who had maimed a good white man, had nearly killed another, and had declared a vendetta against the white race. By noon, the colonel had interviewed as many prominent men as he could find, and they became increasingly difficult to find as it became known that he was seeking them. The town, he said, had been disgraced, and should redeem itself by prosecuting the lynchers. He may as well have talked to the empty air. The trail of Fetters was all over the town. Some of the officials owed Fetters money. Others were under political obligations to him. Others were plainly of the opinion that the Negro got no more than he deserved. Such a wretch was not fit to live. The coroner's jury returned a verdict of suicide, a grim joke which evoked some laughter. Dr. McKenzie, to whom the colonel expressed his feelings, and whom he asked to throw the influence of his church upon the side of law and order, said, "'It is too bad. I am sorry, but it is done. Let it rest.' No good can ever come of stirring it up further. Later in the day there came news that the lynchers, after completing their task, had proceeded to the Dudley plantation and whipped all the Negroes who did not learn of their coming in time to escape, the claim being that Johnson could not have maintained himself in hiding without their connivance, and that they were therefore parties to his crimes. The colonel felt very much depressed when he went to bed that night, and lay for a long time turning over in his mind the problem that confronted him. So far he had been beaten, except in the matter of the cotton mill, which was yet unfinished. His efforts in Bud Johnson's behalf, the only thing he had undertaken to please the woman he loved, had proved abortive. 
his promise to the teacher, well, he had done his part, but to no avail. He would be ashamed to meet Taylor face to face. With what conscience could a white man in Clarendon ever again ask a Negro to disclose the name or hiding place of a colored criminal? In the effort to punish the lynchers, he stood, to all intents and purposes, single-handed and alone, and without the support of public opinion he could do nothing. The colonel was beaten, but not dismayed. Perhaps God and his wisdom had taken Phil away, that his father might give himself more completely and single-mindedly to the battle before him. Had Phil lived, a father might have hesitated to expose a child's young and impressionable mind to the things which these volcanic outbursts of passion between mismated races might cause at any unforeseen moment. Now that the way was clear, he could go forward, hand in hand, with the good woman who had promised to wed him, in the work he had laid out. He would enlist good people to demand better laws under which Fetters and his kind would find it harder to prey upon the weak. Diligently he would work to lay wide and deep the foundations of prosperity, education, and enlightenment, upon which should rest justice, humanity, and civic righteousness. In this he would find a worthy career. Patiently would he await the results of his labors, and if they came not in great measure in his own lifetime, he would be content to know that after years would see their full fruition. So that night he sat down and wrote a long answer to Kirby's letter, in which he told him of Phil's death and burial, and his own grief. Something there was, too, of his plans for the future, including his marriage to a good woman who would help him in them. Kirby, he said, had offered him a golden opportunity for which he thanked him heartily. The scheme was good enough for anyone to venture upon, but to carry out his own plans would require that he invest his money in the state of his residence, where there were many openings for capital that could afford to wait upon development for large returns. He sent his best regards to Mrs. Jervis and his assurance that Kirby's plan was a good one. Perhaps Kirby and she alone could handle it, if not, there must be plenty of money elsewhere for so good a thing. He sealed the letter and laid it aside to be mailed in the morning. To his mind it had all the force of a final renunciation, a severance of the last link that bound him to his old life. Long the colonel lay, thinking, after he retired to rest, and the muffled striking of the clock downstairs had marked the hour of midnight ere he fell asleep and he had scarcely dozed away when he was awakened by a scraping noise, as though somewhere in the house a heavy object was being drawn across the floor. The sound was not repeated, however, and, thinking it some trick of the imagination, he soon slept again. As the colonel slept this second time, he dreamed of a regenerated South, filled with thriving industries and thronged with a prosperous and happy people, where every man, having enough for his needs, was willing that every other man should have the same, where law and order should prevail unquestioned, and where every man could enter, through the golden gate of hope, the field of opportunity where lay the prizes of life which all might have an equal chance to win or lose. For even in his dreams, the colonel's sober mind did not stray beyond the bounds of reason and experience. That all men would ever be equal, he did not even dream. There would always be the strong and the weak, the wise and the foolish, but that each man, in his little life in this our little world, might be able to make the most of himself, was an ideal which even the colonel's waking hours would not have repudiated. Following this pleasing thread with the unconscious rapidity of dreams, the colonel passed, in a few brief minutes, through a long and useful life to a happy end, when he too rested with his father's by the side of his son, and on his tomb was graven what was said of Ben Adam, Here lies one who loves his fellow men, and the further words, and tried to make them happy. Shortly after dawn there was a loud rapping at the colonel's door. Come downstairs and look on the piazza, colonel, said the agitated voice of the servant who had knocked. Come quick, sir. There was a vague terror in the man's voice that stirred the colonel strangely. He threw on a dressing gown and hastened downstairs, and to the front door of the hall which stood open. 
a handsome mahogany burial casket, stained with earth and disfigured by rough handling, rested upon the floor of the piazza, where it had been deposited during the night. Conspicuously nailed to the coffin lid was a sheet of white paper, upon which were some lines rudely scrawled in a handwriting that matched the spelling. Colonel French, take notice. Bear your old nigger somewhere else. He can't stay in Oak Cemetery. The majority of the white people of this town who didn't tend your nigger funeral won't have him there. Niggers by their selves, white people by their selves, and them that lives in our town must bide by our rules, by order of committee. The colonel left the coffin standing on the porch where it remained all day, an object of curious interest to the scores and hundreds who walked by to look at it, for the news spread quickly through the town. No one, however, came in. If there were those who reprobated the action, they were silent. The mob spirit, which had broken out in the lynching of Johnson, still dominated the town, and no one dared to speak against it. As soon as Colonel French had dressed and breakfasted, he drove over to the cemetery. Those who had exhumed old Peter's remains had not been unduly careful. The carelessly excavated earth had been scattered here and there over the lot. The flowers on old Peter's grave and that of little Phil had been trampled underfoot, whether wantonly or not, inevitably in the execution of the ghoulish task. The colonel's heart hardened as he stood by his son's grave. Then he took a long, lingering look at the tombs of his ancestors and turned away with an air of finality. From the cemetery he went to the undertaker's and left an order, thence to the telegraph office, from which he sent a message to his former partner in New York, and thence to the Treadwells. End of section 36. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 37 of The Colonel's Dream. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Colonel's Dream by Charles Chestnut. Section 37, Chapter 37. Miss Laura came forward with outstretched hands and tear-stained eyes to greet him. Henry, she exclaimed, I am shocked and sorry. I cannot tell you how much, nor do I know what else to say, except that the best people do not, cannot, could not approve of it. The best people, Laura, he said with a weary smile, are an abstraction. When any deviltry is on foot, they are never there to prevent it. They vanish into thin air at its approach. When it is done, they excuse it and they make no effort to punish it. So it is not too much to say that what they permit, they justify, and they cannot shirk the responsibility. To mar the living, it is the history of life, but to make war upon the dead. I'm going away, Laura, never to return. My dream of usefulness is over. Tonight I take away my dead and shake the dust of Clarendon from my feet forever. Will you come with me? Henry, she said, and each word tore her heart. I have been expecting this since I heard. But I cannot go. My duty calls me here. My mother could not be happy anywhere else, nor would I fit into any other life. And here, too, I am useful, and may still be useful, and should be missed. I know your feelings, and would not try to keep you. But, oh, Henry... If all of those who love justice and practice humanity should go away, what would become of us? I leave tonight, he returned, and it is your right to go with me or to come to me. No, Henry, nor am I sure that you would wish me to. It was for the old town's sake that you loved me. I was a part of your dream, a part of the old and happy past upon which you hoped to build, as upon the foundations of the old mill, a broader and a fairer structure. Do you remember what you told me, that night, that happy night, that you loved me because in me you found the embodiment of an ideal? Well, Henry, 
That is why I did not wish to make our engagement known, for I knew, I felt, the difficulty of your task, and I foresaw that you might be disappointed, and I feared that if your ideal should be wrecked, you might find me a burden. I loved you, Henry. I seem to have always loved you, but I would not burden you. No, no, Laura, not so, not so. And you wanted me for Phil's sake, whom we both loved. And now that your dream is over and Phil is gone, I should only remind you of where you lost him, and of your disappointment, and of this other thing. And I could not be sure that you loved me or wanted me. Surely you cannot doubt it, Laura. His voice was firm, but to her sensitive spirit it did not carry conviction. You remembered me for my youth, she continued tremulously, but bravely, and it was the image in your memory that you loved. And now, when you go away, the old town will shrink and fade from your memory, and your heart and you will have none but harsh thoughts of it. Nor can I blame you greatly, for you have grown far away from us, and we shall need many years to overtake you. Nor do you need me, Henry. I am too old to learn new ways, and elsewhere than here I should be a hindrance to you rather than a help. But in the larger life to which you go, think of me now and then as one who loves you still, and who will try, in her poor way, with such patience as she has, to carry on the work which you have begun, and which you... Oh, Henry! He divined her thought, though her tear-filled eyes spoke sorrow rather than reproach. Yes, he said sadly, which I have abandoned. Yes, Laura, abandoned fully and forever. The colonel was greatly moved, but his resolution remained unshaken. Laura, he said, taking both her hands in his, I swear that I should be glad to have you with me. Come away. The place is not fit for you to live in. No, Henry, it cannot be. I could not go. My duty holds me here. God would not forgive me if I abandoned it. Go your way, live your life, marry some other woman, if you must, who will make you happy. But I shall keep, Henry. Nothing can ever take away from me the memory of one happy summer. No, no, Laura, it need not be so. I shall write you. You'll think better of it. But I go tonight. Not one hour longer than I must will I remain in this town. I must bid your mother and Graciela good-bye. He went into the house. Mrs. Treadwell was excited and sorry, and would have spoken at length, but the colonel's farewells were brief. I cannot stop to say more than good-bye, dear Mrs. Treadwell. I have spent a few happy months in my old home, and now I am going away. Laura will tell you the rest. Graciela was tearfully indignant. It was a shame, she declared. Peter was a good old nigger, and it wouldn't have done anybody any harm to leave him there. I'd rather be buried beside old Peter than near any of the poor white trash that dug him up. So there. I'm so sorry you're going away. But I hope sometime, she added stoutly, to see you in New York. Don't forget. I'll send you my address, said the colonel. End of section 37. Recording by James K. White. Chula Vista. Section 38 of The Colonel's Dream. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Colonel's Dream by Charles Chestnut. Section 38. Chapter 38. It was a few weeks later. Old Ralph Dudley and Viney had been buried. Ben Dudley had ridden in from Mink Run, had hitched his horse in the back yard as usual, and was seated on the top step of the piazza beside Graciela. His elbows rested on his knees and his chin upon his hand. Graciela had unconsciously imitated his drooping attitude. Both were enshrouded in the deepest gloom and had been sunk for several minutes in a silence equally profound. Graciela was the first to speak. Well, then, 
she said with a deep sigh. "'There is absolutely nothing left?' "'Not a thing,' he groaned hopelessly. "'Except my horse and my clothes, and a few odds and ends which belong to me. "'Fetters will have the land. "'There's not enough to pay the mortgages against it, "'and I'm in debt for the funeral expenses. "'And what are you going to do?' "'Gracious knows. I wish I did. "'I came over to consult the family. "'I have no trade.' "'No profession, no land, and no money. "'I can get a job at breaking on the railroad, "'or maybe at clerking in a store. "'I'd have asked the colonel for something in the mill, "'but that chance is gone.' "'Gone,' echoed Graciela gloomily. "'I see my fate. "'I shall marry you, because I can't help loving you, "'and couldn't live without you. "'And I shall never get to New York, "'but be all my life... "'A poor man's wife, a poor white man's wife. "'No, Graciela, we might be poor, but not poor white. "'Our blood will still be of the best. "'It will be all the same. "'Blood without money may count for one generation, "'but it won't hold out for two. "'They relapsed into a gloom so profound, so rayless, "'that they might almost be said to have reveled in it. "'It was lightened, or at least a diversion was created by Miss Laura's opening the garden gate and coming up the walk. Ben rose as she approached, and Graciela looked up. "'I have been to the post office,' said Miss Laura. "'Here is a letter for you, Ben, addressed in my care. It has the New York postmark. "'Thank you, Miss Laura.' Eagerly, Ben's hand tore the envelope and drew out the enclosure. Swiftly his eyes devoured the lines— they were typewritten and easy to follow. Glory, he shouted. Glory, hallelujah. Listen. He read the letter aloud, while Graciela leaned against his shoulder and feasted her eyes upon the words. The letter was from Colonel French. My dear Ben, I was very much impressed with the model of a cotton gin and press which I saw you exhibit one day at Mrs. Treadwell's. You have a fine genius for mechanics, and the model embodies, I think, a clever idea which is worth working up. If your uncle's death has left you free to dispose of your time, I should like to have you come on to New York with the model, and we will take steps to have the invention patented at once and form a company for its manufacture. As an evidence of good faith, I enclose my draft for $500, which can be properly accounted for in our future arrangements. "'Oh, Ben,' gasped Graciela, in one long, drawn-out, ecstatic sigh. "'Oh, Graciela!' exclaimed Ben, as he threw his arms around her and kissed her rapturously, regardless of Miss Laura's presence. "'Now you can go to New York as soon as you like.'" End of Section 38 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Section 39 of The Colonel's Dream This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White The Colonel's Dream by Charles Chestnut Section 39, Chapter 39 Colonel French took his dead to the north and buried both the little boy and the old servant in the same lot with his young wife, and in the shadow of the stately mausoleum which marked her resting place. There, surrounded by the monuments of the rich and the great, in a beautiful cemetery which overlooks a noble harbor where the ships of all nations move in endless procession, the body of the faithful servant rests beside that of the dear little child whom he unwittingly lured to his death and then died in the effort to save and in all the great company of those who have laid their dead there in love or in honor, there is none to question old Peter's presence or the colonel's right to lay him there. Sometimes at night, a ray of light from the uplifted torch of the Statue of Liberty, the gift of a free people to a free people, falls athwart the white stone which marks his resting place, fit prophecy and omen of the day when the Son of Liberty shall shine alike upon all men. When the colonel went away from Clarendon, he left his affairs in Caxton's hands, 
with instructions to settle them up as expeditiously as possible. The cotton mill project was dropped, and existing contracts closed on the best terms available. Fetters paid the old note. Even he would not have escaped odium for so bare-faced a robbery. And Mrs. Treadwell's last days could be spent in comfort and Miss Laura saved from any fear for her future and enabled to give more freely to the poor and needy. Barclay Fetters recovered the use of one eye and, embittered against the whole Negro race by his disfigurement, went into public life and devoted his talents and his education to their debasement. The colonel had relented sufficiently to contemplate making over to Miss Laura the old family residence in trust for use as a hospital with a suitable fund for its maintenance, but it unfortunately caught fire and burned down, and he was hardly sorry. He sent Catherine, Bud Johnson's wife, a considerable sum of money, and she bought a gorgeous suit of mourning, and after a decent interval, consoled herself with a new husband. And he sent word to the committee of colored men, to whom he had made a definite promise, that he would be ready to fulfill his obligation in regard to their school whenever they should have met the conditions. One day, a year or two after leaving Clarendon, as the colonel, in company with Mrs. French, formerly a member of his firm, now his partner in a double sense, was riding upon a fast train between New York and Chicago upon a trip to visit a western mine in which the reorganized French and Company Limited were interested, he noticed that the Pullman car porter, a tall and stalwart Negro, was watching him furtively from time to time. Upon one occasion, when the colonel was alone in the smoking room, the porter addressed him. "'Excuse me, sir,' he said. "'I've been wondering, ever since we left New York, if you wasn't Colonel French.' "'Yes, I'm Mr. French, Colonel French, if you want it so.' "'I lied it must be you, sir, though you've changed the cut of your beard, and are looking a little older, sir. "'I don't suppose you remember me.' "'I've seen you somewhere,' said the colonel, no longer the colonel, but like the porter. Let us have it so. "'Where was it?' "'I'm Henry Taylor, sir, that used to teach school at Clarendon. I reckon you remember me now.' "'Yes,' said the colonel sadly. "'I remember you now, Taylor, to my sorrow. I didn't keep my word about Johnson, did I?' "'Oh, yes, sir,' replied the porter.' I never doubted but what you'd keep your word. But you see, sir, they were too many for you. There ain't no one man can stop them folks down there when they once get started. And what are you doing here, Taylor? Well, sir, the fact is that after you went away, it got out somehow that I had told on Bud Johnson. I don't know how they learned it, and of course I knew you didn't tell it, but somebody must have seen me going to your house, or else some of my enemies guessed it and happened to guess right. And after that, the colored folks wouldn't send their children to me, and I lost my job and wasn't able to get another anywhere in the state. The folks said I was an enemy of my race, and what was more important to me, I found that my race was an enemy to me. So I got out, sir, and I came north hoping to find something better. This is the best job I've struck yet, but I'm hoping that sometime or other I'll find something worthwhile. "'And what became of the industrial school project?' asked the colonel. "'I've stood ready to keep my promise and more, but I never heard from you.' "'Well, sir, after you went away, the enthusiasm kind of died out, "'and some of the white folks throwed cold water on it, and it fell through, sir.' "'When the porter came along before the train reached Chicago, "'the colonel offered Taylor a handsome tip. "'Thank you, sir,' said the porter. "'but I'd rather not take it. "'I'm a porter now, but I wasn't always one, "'and hope I won't always be one. "'And doing all the time I taught school in Clarendon, "'you was the only white man that ever treated me quite like a man, "'and our folks just like people. "'And if you won't think I'm presuming, "'I'd rather not take the money.' "'The colonel shook hands with him and took his address. "'Shortly afterward he was able to find him "'something better than menial employment.' where his education would give him an opportunity for advancement. Taylor is fully convinced that his people will never get very far along in the world without the goodwill of the white people, but he is still wondering how they will secure it, for he regards Colonel French as an extremely fortunate accident.
and so the colonel faltered, and, having put his hand to the plough, turned back. But was not his, after all, the only way? For no more now than when the man of sorrows looked out over the Mount of Olives can men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles. The seed which the colonel sowed seemed to fall by the wayside, it is true, but other eyes have seen with the same light, and while fetters and his kind still dominate their section, other hands have taken up the fight which the colonel dropped. In manufactures, the South has gone forward by leaps and bounds. The strong arm of the government, guided by a wise and just executive, has been reached out to crush the poisonous growth of peonage, and men hitherto silent have raised their voices to commend. Here and there a brave judge has condemned the infamy of the chain gang and convict lease systems. Good men north and south have banded themselves together to promote the cause of popular education. Slowly, like all great social changes, but visibly to the eye of faith, is growing up a new body of thought, favorable to just laws and their orderly administration. In this changed attitude of mind lies the hope of the future, the hope of the Republic. But Clarendon has had its chance, nor seems yet to have had another. Other towns, some not far from it, lying nearer the main lines of travel, have been swept into the current of modern life, but not yet Clarendon. There the grass grows thicker in the streets. The meditative cows still graze in the vacant lot between the post office and the bank, where the public library was to stand. The old academy has grown more dilapidated than ever, and a large section of plaster has fallen from the wall, carrying with it the pencil drawing made in the colonel's school days. And if Miss Laura Treadwell sees that the graves of the old Frenches are not allowed to grow up in weeds and grass, the colonel knows nothing of it. The pigs and the loafers, leaner pigs and lazier loafers, still sleep in the shade when the pound-keeper and the constable are not active. The limpid water of the creek still murmurs down the slope and ripples over the stone foundation of what was to have been the new dam, while the birds have nested for some years in the vines that soon overgrew the unfinished walls of the colonel's cotton mill. White men go their way, and black men theirs, and these ways grow wider apart, and no one knows the outcome. But there are those who hope, and those who pray, that this condition will pass, that some day our whole land will be truly free, and the strong will cheerfully help to bear the burdens of the weak, and justice the seed, and peace the flower of liberty, will prevail throughout all our borders. End of section 39. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. End of the Colonel's Dream by Charles Chestnut.